Father, I thank you for your goodness and I thank you again for absolutely everything you did through Jesus. And Father, I ask that you continue to quicken to us how simple the finished work of the cross is and and who we are within your kingdom, you know, more specifically who you are in us and who we are in you. And Father, I pray that everybody will have an ear to hear what your spirit is saying so that everybody will learn to commune with you, to hear you and know how to be led by you in every area of their life. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that signs and wonders will follow and continue to follow the preaching of Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, today we're going to continue in our prayer series and we're talking about prayer uh, and spiritual warfare. So uh, we're up to lesson four on prayer and spiritual warfare. Um, if this is the first lesson that you've, hang on, I'll just go out here. This is the first lesson that you've uh, landed on in our prayer series. This is a just one message amongst a whole series that we have done on New Covenant Prayer. And we've gone through everything we have been taught on prayer, all the scriptures that we've been taught on prayer, and we've been bringing it into a New Covenant lens. So here's some of the other lessons we did. We did dysfunctions of prayer. We did misconceptions on prayer. And uh, now we're up to um, prayer and spiritual warfare. And then we've just got a couple of lessons to go. Uh, God willing. So with everything we share, we make sure we're led by the Spirit. So it's a word in season. And I really believe that that what we share each week will be a word in season for you. So with prayer and spiritual warfare, we've done, as I said, this is a fourth lesson. So we covered your position and your authority. Uh, we covered how prayer and spiritual warfare um, for your loved ones. And last lesson was for yourself. And today we're going to cover the topic of uh, warfare over cities and areas and regions. And what we've been doing is looking at what the Bible says uh, regarding these things. So it really is important that we do come from a um, foundation of what the Bible says, what God says on this, because I think if we have that as our foundation, then we build on that, then we know that we're going to experience the results that we're uh, believing for. So just what is spiritual warfare? Just This is very, a very condensed, simple version of what I was taught on what uh, prayer and spiritual warfare is. And um, again, I'm covering it through a new covenant lens, uh, but I was taught that prayer and spiritual warfare is praying over areas, uh, people, groups, cities, if you like, or even individual lives by breaking demonic strongholds that are over them that are holding them captive to the enemy. So the whole purpose of the spiritual warfare and attacking the spiritual realm, uh, if you like, is uh, the end goal being to see that um, if there's a deception over a city or something over a, a individual the individual life, that, that'll be broken so that then, then they can respond to the gospel. Um, so that's basically what I was taught, but also spiritual warfare was needed in our own personal lives uh, when we are being attacked by the adversary. So I covered that lesson last week and what the Bible said on that area. So the Bible is, you know, there is a spiritual war. That's um, the reality. There is a, a, a something happening in the spiritual realm, but the Bible is very specific on how uh, we deal with that. And we saw last week, it was so incredibly simple yet powerful, and it was to remain in Jesus and his finished work. And, uh, and I love that. So today we're going to look at that from a perspective of what about praying for certain areas and regions. So when you go into a certain area, um, I know there's a few prayer ministries that do do that. They send out intercessors before they uh, go to a place. Uh, a couple of well-known uh, preachers have done this where they'll go and do spiritual mapping and, and go around and learn what that area or that city has been involved in and then they'll break down the spiritual strongholds through prayer, etc. So we're going to look at that today through a biblical perspective and what the Bible says about this. Um, now, when I talk about what the Bible says, I don't want to become too legalistic and say, well, you know, you know, you know you know what I mean? And be dogmatic. But I think if there's going to be a ministry under the new covenant, if there's going to be, especially when it comes to spiritual warfare, I really believe that the Bible will be quite clear on the matter. And, uh, and, and Jesus would have shared on it and Paul and elsewhere. As we know, the Bible says, uh, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every matter be established. 
Um, so that's just where my standing is. Um, I'm all for being led by the Spirit. So as Paul said in Galatians 5, if you're led by the Spirit, then you're not under any law, not under the law of Moses. So let the Holy Spirit guide and lead you in everything you do. Okay, so just uh, really... Um, Briefly, uh, just to understand this lesson further, I would encourage you to watch the previous three lessons on what we've covered to date. Uh, as I said, this is a fourth lesson in this series, so I'll give you a bit of a bit of understanding. Other thing is uh, what we shared earlier on in this prayer series on how to pray for others, but even uh, when it goes through misconceptions of prayer, to have a bit of an understanding what binding and loosing is and isn't, what intercession is and isn't as well. So that will help uh, you understand this message uh, in a lot more detail. Um, as you know, we're up to you know 20 plus messages in this series. So there, we have gone through line upon line and precept upon precept. And so generally speaking in Christendom, when someone asks a question or uh, bring up a scripture and they want an answer on a, you know, the biblical standpoint or viewpoint from that scripture, unfortunately, it's not always a simple answer. There's sort of a whole lot of background information that has to be given. And it really is line upon line, precept upon precept to really start to help us to renew our minds, to see things as they really are. And then learn how to filter it through the new covenant and Jesus' finished work. Okay, so today, that's sort of where we are at in this prayer series. So today we're covering prayer and spiritual warfare over looking at what the Bible says over cities, areas and regions. And these are the three main things I'm going to cover today. So I hope I can get through it uh, with you. So I'm going to look a bit about Daniel and the Prince of Persia because that is uh, pretty much where a lot of the prayer ministries have based their theology from. And then we're going to look at Jesus and, and what Jesus said when he sent out people and what he did where as he sent out his disciples before he went and ministered. And the same with Paul's ministry as well. So um, it's actually really uh, an interesting um, thing to go through and study this because it's it just gives you a deeper understanding of, of how they ministered and what they came across how they dealt with it with all those things because so i believe that's going to help us today in our journey and uh, okay so we're going to begin with daniel's encounter so uh, this begins in in daniel t chapter 10 and this is uh the the third time that it speaks about daniel um, having an encounter. So let's begin. So Dan, actually second. So Daniel 10 verses 1 to 3, and I'm reading the NIV in these two, um, in this Daniel chapter 10. So it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Bel Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. Uh, other translations say the 21 days or three weeks of days, which is three times seven, which is 21 days, which is a Hebrew um, way of speaking in that regard. So three weeks or 21 days uh, that this took place. And then just due to time, we're not going to go through this from verses 4 to 11, then talks about how um, Daniel was at the side of a river and then he gets this, uh, this bright light comes and he sees this amazing vision. And all the men that were with him, just this fear came upon them and they ran and hid. They didn't see or hear anything. Only Daniel did. So it, then it describes uh, Gabriel, this angel that came to speak to Daniel and it describes his appearance. And um, Daniel is greatly afraid, falls down on his face. And, and I love it because the first thing the angel does is say, no, get up. Don't be, don't be afraid. Do not fear. Stand to your feet. And so we'll pick this up in 12 to 14. And so uh, Gabriel says to Daniel, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. 
But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Okay, and so then as you continue to read chapter 10 and 11, it then the vision is explained to him in detail. And uh, as you can see here in verse 14, it's the, I've come to explain to you in the context, what's the context? What will happen to your people, to Israel in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So I think really understanding the context of this is always important. And as we always share with you, who is saying what to whom and why? What covenant were they under? What does this mean? Then look at that within its context before we start to pull it apart and then start to apply it to our own lives. So I'm just going to keep this really simple today. I don't want to make, because I could do a whole message on this, but we did touch on this in a little bit more detail than what I'm covering today in our fasting series. Last year, we did a whole series on fasting. I think there was about six lessons on fasting, and we went through the old covenant and what that said, the new covenant, and we went through nearly, I think, 99% of the scriptures, and then we filtered those through the context of how they were written and through a new covenant lens to see what applies and doesn't apply to us as post-cross children of God today. So within that series, the third lesson it was on fasting scriptures is where you're going to find uh, the details that I've covered on Daniel. And there was actually three uh, accounts. There was two. There was another vision in chapter nine. Uh, another fast, and immediately uh, the angel came and gave um, Daniel the answer. He was reading about Israel being released. Uh, from bondage and captivity and immediately the angel came and shared that with him and we also covered in that series uh, what was known today as um, Daniel's diet how he went on a specific diet for a certain period of time so we're just going to look at that within its context what it meant what happened and and if or if that doesn't apply to new covenant believers so you can get that on our church not my uh nearer to walker youtube our church youtube river christian church um you'll probably see our logo uh probably on the first page i'll have to bring that up for you the address the address if you are interested in more of these videos from our church if you would pop on find our youtube channel and then subscribe and then once we get some more subscribers um, we can then have our own uh, designated, um, like for River Church, uh, to go up there for you. So you'll be able to find that a lot easier. So that's the con that, that I do go in a lot more detail. So in verse 1, we saw that uh, Daniel said, I received a revelation and, and I received the answer or the understanding to that within the vision. And then he explains uh, and goes on from there. So he says after 21 um, days, in fact, that answer came. Because and then in two, verses 2 and 3, he said that he fasted off certain foods for that 21 days or the three weeks, three um, lots of seven. And he said that, and then the text doesn't give us a list, a specific list of what he ate and what he didn't eat. It does in his diet, uh, whether it's the same here for the same reasons or not. Um, uh, you'd ha you really would have to read that in the text because it's not clear. It just says he didn't eat uh, choice foods and uh, no, no rich or choice foods and he didn't drink any wine or didn't use any lotions for that period of time. So then that's what we saw there uh, for that. And then we saw in verses 12 to 14 when da Gabriel showed up after that 21-day period and said to Daniel, you know, um, we saw that he said, as soon as you prayed, immediately when you prayed, I came to for your words. I came to, uh, like I was sent to come and deliver the understanding of, of that revelation regarding Israel to you, but the king of the, or the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. And then Michael, an archangel, had to come and um, help me and overcome this uh, prince of Persia. And so basically goes, here I am, I'm now going to, and then he delivers the message to him. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people have read into this passage and taken this and used it as the foundation of spiritual warfare, especially over praying for certain areas and regions um, 
uh, with in today in the New Covenant. Uh, when you read a couple of the commentaries on this, there's a couple that go in detail how Israel... Uh, and remember, Israel really wasn't obedient to God at this stage. She was in captivity in Babylon, and uh, she was pretty much as a as a nation. Um, just prior to this, Daniel was saying he, like how grieved he was from the previous vision he was given regarding Israel. But over the state of Israel themselves, there was a couple of feasts and festivals that they weren't observing. Daniel observed them on his own. So they weren't really living the way they were meant to be living. So there was a whole lot of the pagan stuff of Babylon kind of got adopted into their belief system around this time. Um, remember, they really pretty much weren't uh, following and listening to God. And so when you read some of these commentaries, it says that they ended up with this list of um, demonic princes over regions. Um, some say they had a list of four uh, of the archangels and uh, princes over regions. And some say they had seven list of seven archangels. So, um, but a lot of it isn't mentioned in our, uh, the New Testament or in our scriptures. So, even though it was Jewish and it was uh, what they wrote and what they communicated, I, I'd kind of be a bit wary of what we're going to adopt as believers, and because. Uh, Israel pretty much added a lot of stuff, not just to their own law, but there was a lot of traditions and doctrines of men. I mean, even regarding fasting, we saw in the fasting series, by the time they got to Jesus' time, there were so many different fastings and, and rituals and things they were doing, and none of them were in the Mosaic law. They kind of added them themselves. And, you know, Jesus said to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the scribes, he said, the traditions and doctrines of men really have made my word to no effect, uh, really, because they've added a whole lot of stuff to it. So I think within the text within itself, I think it really is quite simple to understand. So I'm just going to read out a commentary to you just to um, rather me saying what this says perfectly. So this is Dr. Thomas Constable, another uh, great resource for you to look at commentaries and to dig a bit deeper into the word is on studylight.org. Um, there's a lot more commentaries on there. A lot of them are more modern commentaries than what you'll find on Bible Gateway or sorry, biblehub.com. The more modern ones uh, their belief system is pretty much uh, their viewpoint on what other people have kind of taught later on. I prefer to kind of get my foundations on the earlier guys and then build on that. And you'll also see in studylight.org is with the, I think it's like two dozen commentaries. You can then filter them through Calvinism, those that are Calvinists, those that are Arminius, uh, which is John Wesley, and um uh, dispensationalists and just different viewpoints because then you'll see their viewpoint come across in what how they rightly divide scripture or how they divide scripture not necessarily rightly all the time so but here dr thomas constable says he says on this passage he says there has been much interest in spiritual warfare in recent years among professing christians certainly spiritual warfare is a biblical revelation and we need to be aware of it and live accordingly I agree wholeheartedly. However, much that is being taught about spiritual warfare and particularly about de territorial demons goes beyond the teaching of Scripture. The idea that there are territorial demons rests primarily on this passage in Daniel 10.13. For example, there is no biblical instruction or precedent that would justify praying against and claiming victory over certain demons by name, as some are doing and advocating today. Look at this. Clearly, Daniel did not know about this heavenly conflict between these angels. Michael's success was not due to Daniel's praying for or against certain angels or demons. And I'll put to you that it also wasn't his prayer and fasting that enabled um, Michael the archangel to come and uh, release them. So, because that's what's being taught on this passage, that we need to persevere in prayer because there's a spiritual battle. So the more you pray, the more you travail, the more you fast, the more you do stuff, is the more power there is in the spiritual realm. But when you line that up through the finished work of the cross and what we know how the kingdom works, that does not filter through. It doesn't pass the checklist, does it? That, that litmus test so and then it concludes Daniel while supporting the idea of territorial identification of certain angels especially in chapter 10 does not support any sort of human involvement in angelic warfare and even if you read uh, in the New Testament where it talks about um, 
that uh, I think it was Michael was disputing with the devil uh, again. It's with Moses' body um, of who was going to get Moses' body, and and, and uh, the angel Michael said, or the angel said, the Lord rebuke you. Um, he didn't attack the devil in any way, shape, or form. It's like it was all through the Jesus' authority there. Um, don't want to go too much into that, but. I hope you can understand that point there, that that really when we look at the context of this passage, there is a lot that has been read in this passage. A lot has been taken and twisted. Uh, whole doctrines have been formed about spiritual warfare on this one passage. But you do have to read into it. Like Thomas Constable says here, there is no instruction whatsoever for us to do uh, to attack the angels in the spiritual realm whatsoever. And uh, that Daniel had no involvement. Who was the victory there? What was the victory? It was God. It was the battle was God's. Uh, some commentaries say that uh, Michael, the archangel, was Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus himself. Others don't. They just say it was Michael, the archangel. There's three references to Michael. And there's, you know, I did a little bit of a study there. I don't know where I sit on whether it's Jesus or not. Um, but either way, I believe the victory came because of God and, and what God did on Daniel, and not Daniel's behalf, on Israel's behalf here. It's regarding a whole nation. So that's the context of what is happening here. So we saw that Daniel set his mind to gain understanding on the revelation regarding a, a, a revelation that he had regarding Israel's future. He'd already had um, something delivered to him uh, prior to this through another fast. He was fasting and, it, you know, it was just a quick short fast of total food. And then he was given the answer. So he was perplexed about that. And he had a revelation on Israel's future and saw where they were at spiritually, if you like. And then so he really needed a deeper understanding of what that meant. And so that's why Gabriel came to deliver this message to him regarding Israel's future. Okay, the context had nothing to do with um, a healing of a disease or the saving of an individual, you know, it was a whole nation. It was regarding Israel's future is the context there. And so you'll also see that when Gabriel then came and spoke to him, there's no mention of Daniel's actions contributing to that breakthrough or for Daniel to fast again for any future revelation or understanding. Um, or um, to address that spiritual realm directly. You won't see that. Uh, and it's such a shame that that has happened out of this passage. You know, this is one account in Scripture, yet there's massive doctrines that have come out of it. But as I just shared, the battle and the victory was God's. God was the one that fought on Daniel's behalf. He had no idea of the battle that was happening behind the scenes there. Had no idea. So that was brought to his awareness. So he knew why the delay. And that's why I believe Gabriel told him that. This is why I didn't come immediately because I was detained. But I was sent straight away. So for I've heard so many teachings on uh, persevering in prayer because you don't know the battle uh, that's happening behind the scenes. So you need to pray and travail and until that breakthrough happens, until you get that answer. So let's filter that, how that relates to us personally in the new covenant. See, I totally believe that when you understand the new covenant, what we've already been given, the demonic realm cannot stop you from receiving revelation or understanding, which is the context here, right? He can't because God doesn't speak to new covenant believers through angels. You know, angels don't have to come and give us a message to, to share about our future. Um, it, Paul even spoke about those that um, he said, just beware of those that talk about having visions of angels and they puff themselves up with knowledge. He said, beware of that. And in fact, you see in Hebrews verses 1, 1 to 3, it talks about how God spoke to Israel as a nation through various means, through the prophets, through angels, through various um, ways um, and at various times. But now it says he has spoken to us through his son, who is the heir of all things. He said he's expressed image of God and he's seated at the right hand of the father. And generally angels didn't speak to uh, to individuals in Israel, only the leader of Israel. And here Daniel represented uh, he was their prophet, if you like. He was there that where God can communicate with him. And he was very instrumental in the releasing um, of Israel from bondage and captivity. So 
Um, context, context, context. We've got to look at that quite clearly. Um, some believers today say they've seen angels. I, I don't dispute that. I'm not saying they do or they don't. But ultimately, how we hear from God today is through Jesus. Okay, so we don't need a visitation from an angel. And even Paul said, we shared this last week, Paul said even if an angel comes from heaven and delivers another gospel than what I share to you, he said, let him be cursed. He said, you know, we saw that last week. So we need to filter everything through the new covenant and through Jesus' finished work. And know that angels are simply messengers. They were sent to minister for the heirs of salvation. As Hebrews 1.14 says that. If you read Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 2, and even half through 3, it talks about angels and really puts angels in their proper place. And, and the author says, as to which of the angels did God say to them to sit at my right hand? You know, So he is exalting um, Paul, I believe, is probably strongly leading towards Paul being the author of Hebrews. He's exalting Jesus, that Jesus is what we need to look at, not at angels, not at signs and not at fleeces or other things, but look to the Son because that's the perfect will of God for our lives. So Hebrews 1, 14 says, uh, not the angels or ministering spirits or servants sent out in the service of God for the assistance of those who are to inherit salvation. We already have inherited salvation, so we have far more than that old covenant. Uh, always remember that because we have the very Holy Spirit himself. And that's why the demonic realm cannot stop or block you from receiving answers from God. Because answers do not come from the form of angels. They do not come from external, from the kingdom, from the throne room in heaven, out through some message to you externally. Where's the kingdom of God, my friends? The kingdom of God is in you. Paul said that. It's not a Jesus said rather. It's not a place that you can say the kingdom of God. So you can observe it and say it's over here or over there. Because he said the kingdom of God is in you, will be in you. And that's what we have through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of Jesus. Revelation, understanding, answers come from within by spirit to spirit. Amen. We spoke a little bit about um, how to hear the Holy Spirit in a lesson I did before we got into spiritual warfare here. So know that if you need understanding, you need revelation, you didn't, don't need to wait for an external answer. You have everything resonant within you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11, 1 to 3. I love that passage of scripture. I believe it is a type of uh, speaking of Jesus and what we have under the new covenant. And it said that a root will come from Jesse and the spirit of God will rest on him. And it's known as the seven spirits of God or the seven eyes of God in the book of Revelation that says, um, it ties that in together. And yes, that's pertaining to Israel, but it's also the ministry of what we have through the Holy Spirit who gives wisdom, understanding, counsel, which is the plan of action and might to know and to worship him more. So that is, but that's for us is the kingdom is in us, comes in that inner witness. And we cover that also in praying in the spirit etc. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So any wisdom, any revelation, it comes from the spirit that we have already received. Amen. So you don't need to pray or fast from that. There's no spiritual warfare that you need to break out there. The only blockage is in here, our thinking, our understanding, not knowing how to rightly divide what we hear, filter it through this new covenant, etc. So that's a growing process where we need to learn how to, to filter things through that. So what, Ephesians 1, 17 to 18. Now a few words have been added into this and I love, love, love if all of Ephesians 1, all of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, in fact, very powerful. And I actually encourage you to read it in the Amplified Classic. It's really amazing. But I love this bit here where Paul says, I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you. And when you look at the Greek, it is this is what we already have, okay? Because 13 to 14, two verses prior to this, he says that when you believe you were sealed with the spirit of promise, who's that guaranteed until the redemption of the purchased possession, which is our glorified body. So when we believed in Jesus, we were sealed with the spirit. So we already have this, that he may grant you, which we already have a spirit of wisdom and revelation of what? 
of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. And knowledge means knowing by experience. By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set apart ones. What's that glorious inheritance? It's the Holy Spirit's the kingdom of God in you. New Covenant believers, we have already been equipped and empowered with everything we need for life and for godliness. We can get wisdom, understanding, everything we need through having an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us. Amen. It is so simple. So that's why we need to filter what we read in different accounts in the Bible and bring it through what we now have under the New Covenant. Look at the context. What's the context? And then work out, does that really relate? So it's got nothing to do with being persistent in prayer. Daniel didn't know what was happening. He was given that knowledge. That's why it took so long. He wasn't told because of your prayer and fasting is why the breakthrough happened. No, he was just given that knowledge. That's why it took so long, but not the instructions that that's what he needed to do in the future or that's the reason for the breakthrough. Hope that's quite clear. You really have to read into the scriptures to see that. And if it was a... um, a valid form of ministry for Israel's breakthrough, uh, then it would be instructions on it and etc. And you'd have that already out, outlined within the Mosaic law, etc. For Israel. Okay, so and we saw also in the last two lessons on praying for your loved ones and then praying for yourself in regards to spiritual warfare, that there's an, even in the new covenant, we're going to go through the new covenant, there's no uh, directions for a believer to actually fight the demonic realm in the heavenlies okay there's no instruction whatsoever to attack that realm we know that what jesus has done he's disarmed the devil and all his works and given us power and authority in that area as we're going to see and we saw in lesson one as well that uh, we can then walk in victory over what we face but there's no instructions about specifically praying over areas or demonic areas and we're going to look at jesus ministry and exactly what he did because he encountered a lot of demonic and also paul paul faced a lot of really interesting stuff in demonic the demonic realm so we're going to look at what they did and what they said and what they taught in regards to this so new covenant now we're going to look at jesus ministry and what how he uh what he did with his disciples how he sent them out and the instructions he gave and what happened when uh, to how he sent them in to soften up a city? What was what did Jesus do? What did Paul do? Uh, and when they rejected them, uh, rejected the gospel, rejected Jesus, what then happened? Were there, you know, we're going to look at that from a biblical standpoint. So just very simply, so we're going to look at what Jesus taught. And this is just a really, uh, I want to keep this short and sweet, but I believe that I'm giving you enough information for you to go and ponder on this and meditate on this and look deeper for yourself. I'm not going to read all of Luke chapter 9. We're going to go through Luke chapter 9 and then Luke chapter 10 because it's quite a lot um, within this. So we're going to look at that uh, within its context, but I'm just going to share certain scriptures just due to time. So you can go and read it all uh, in one sitting in your own time so Luke chapter 9 verse 1 it speaks of saying speaking of Jesus it says he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases and so what did Jesus do he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick and he said to them take nothing for the journey neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money and do not have two tunics a piece whatever house you enter stay there and from there depart and whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. I love it. It's so, so good. So question, let's look at what did Jesus do? What did Jesus say in regard to prepare the way for Jesus here as they went to minister? He sent them to preach the kingdom of God. So he gave him his power and authority to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So talking about individuals' lives, right? Um, That is the way he sent them to prepare the way. 
And then as we get to, there's, you can keep reading. And then as we get to verses 51 to 56, so it came to pass. So that's what they were doing. And then um, it said, when the time had come for him to be received up, so it's speaking of Jesus, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. Okay, so Jesus sent his disciples out before him, before his face. We know that's a figure of speech to go and prepare the way. And we just saw how that was by preaching the kingdom and healing the sick. Okay, and so and as they went, they entered into a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. How is the preparation done? By preaching the good news of the kingdom. Jesus is your Messiah is the context. If we look at this is the Gospels pre-cross. Jews under the law preaching to other Jews about Jesus being their Messiah preaching the kingdom of God has come near you this is the kingdom that we've been believing for all these years the Messiah everything that's been prophesied uh, is all pointing to Jesus so that so they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem and it's not that wasn't cause that was through their own hardness of heart why that happened and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Okay, so here's James and John. They're called this, I can't remember the Hebrew, um, uh, the, the son of sons of whatever, but it's basically sons of fire or sons of danger. And uh, so James and John said, you know, let's call down fire. Here's a whole this Samaritan village that has completely rejected you. So, you know, it's turn or burn, James and John. So you either turn to Jesus or we're going to burn you alive, really, is the message that they had in their heart. And uh, Elijah, like there's an account with Elijah that, I mean, he burned everything around him, not only with the prophets of Baal and he burned up the, the um, with the altars there, but also when uh, a king sent out 50 men to see Elijah, he was on a hill and they said, look, if you're really the son of, like the, a man of God, come down and speak to us. And they were really going to take... Elijah captive and take him prisoner and he said well if I'm a man of God let fire from heaven come down and it did and it consumed the 50 men so the silly king sent another 50 men same thing happened third time another 50 men so three times you think he'd learned this the first time right if not the second time so Elijah burned three lots of 50 men alive okay <laughs> and people that were had pretty much rejected God you know his enemies and here these people are anti-Christ if you like they're against Christ in that regard that's the term I'm using for that and uh, so they, they've rejected Jesus and they're saying okay Jesus let's call down fire let's burn these guys alive but look at Jesus response to those who had rejected him but he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Okay, so what do we see here? Uh, as a nation that Jesus had specifically sent these guys, you know, to, to go out everywhere and prepare the way for him. They went to prepare this village and they rejected Jesus. So what was the response? Let's go to another village. <laughs> this village isn't ready. This real village has rejected us. So let's just shake the dust off our feet, wipe the dust off our feet. And that's just their testimony against them. And we will go to another village. Okay. It speaks volumes. If you think on that and what we've been taught about spiritual warfare and we look at what Jesus, the Son of God, actually said what to do, what not to do. And you look at the text and you look at this, you think, wow, you know, it's just within the silence of scripture it speaks a lot it speaks volumes i believe and i think when scripture is silent we do really need to be very careful that we're not adding to uh, what the bible says which many of us have done over the years and i love just bringing everything back to the simple truth because it really does make us free so then that's Luke chapter 9. So now we continue. As you continue, that was the end of, of Luke chapter 9. So we go to chapter 10 and then it says, And after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Okay, so it continues not only the disciples now, he's got another 70 others that he's equipped and empowered um, with uh, the to, to cast out demons, to, to heal the sick and to preach the kingdom of God. And so he says the same thing to them, you know, as we'll see. 
And uh, so this is how they prepare the way for Jesus to come and to show and to bring everybody into uh, the kingdom. And he says to them, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack or sandals and greet no one along the road. Okay, so they went out and they preached the kingdom. They healed the sick. And then he says, whatever you city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the, the, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we will wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Okay, so if they rejected them, there's no... Um, uh, information about having to then spiritual map, prepare, break any demonic strongholds or anything like that. It was simply, if they're going to reject you, walk away. Verse 16, it say, Jesus says, He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me, and he rejects me, and he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me, which we know is the Father. So what is the answer? How do they deal with this? They don't. They just walk off. If their hearts are hardened, if they're not going to listen, move on to another village. And uh, the consistent truth that we've seen throughout this whole prayer series on what scripture itself says is the consistent truth is that everyone has been given a free will to accept or reject uh, the kingdom, the gospel. Uh, and there's nothing new there. There's nothing we've sh we shared with this in the lesson on individual lives. Um, how um, the, we went through the God of this age who blinds the hearts of unbelievers. And we went through the prince of the power of the air who works in the sons of disobedience. We covered those two scriptures. We looked at them in the context and, and what Paul was saying. And we saw that Satan... Uh, cannot control or override a, friend, for a man's free will either. God can't, God won't do it because he highly respects freedom of will. Satan can't either. For, for the kingdom, you need to respond to the kingdom. You need to respond to God's love. And for the adversary, you have to submit to uh, how he's guiding and leading you. But either way, you are a willing participant. And we saw that throughout the scripture. And it's the same for cities and regions. People have an individual um, a choice to to what they're going to do and what not to. Sure, demons can come and, and influence them, uh, absolutely. But there is nothing in Scripture that says to address in the spiritual realm those things. You address a person to their heart, those who come, those who believe. Yeah, you can heal, you can deliver, you can do whatever, but there's no instruction as far as spiritual mapping and all that side of things. Okay. So we saw that the, that's what, exactly what the 70 did. They went out and they healed people. And then look at the response um, down in verse 17 to 19. And it says the 70, because so he sent out the 70, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons sub are subject to us in your name. And the demons here are not over areas or regions. The context over people that were healing and delivering, people that were they were preparing. Remember that, that place for Jesus by he preaching the kingdom and demonstrating the kingdom with power, if you like. And so people would come and, and, and uh, they would pray for them, heal them, cast out if it was a demonic sickness or disease or whatever. Um, that's with the context of here. The demons are submitting to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven amen it's so uh beautiful isn't it when you look at this so again there's no uh reference with what jesus was sharing about going and, and uh spiritual mapping if you like or attacking the spiritual realm they literally were there to go to a place preach the kingdom demonstrate the kingdom uh, which with with for us new covenant believers is with the gifts of the spirit we would demonstrate the kingdom it would draw a crowd people would come they will bring their sick you can minister to them and preach the gospel to them just because they have demons cast out of them and just because they get healed doesn't mean they're going to come to the kingdom so you still need to share the gospel and uh, for them to respond to Jesus and his finished work okay 
Okay, so we've saw that. I've already shared that. That um, So when we saw that even when people rejected Jesus, Jesus just said, just move on. Wipe the dust from your feet. He didn't say you need to pray and fast for that city or any individual. He didn't say that. He said, if they're going to reject you, move on. Okay, just leave them. Just wipe the dust of the feet of, as a testimony against that city, against that people within the city. Okay, and I've already covered that. And so let's surely, and this is what I've put in my PowerPoint here, surely if this is an effective way to minister uh, in Jesus' time and also in the future in our time under the new covenant, you think that Jesus would have mentioned it and given instructions and details on how to do this. But instead, when we look at the cross and we filter, we look at this within its context and then we look at what we have now as a new covenant believer, we know that Jesus disarmed the devil and all his works and there's no instruction to, to fight against a defeated foe. We saw last lesson on individual spiritual warfare that how we gain victory all over all the deceits and the strategies of the devil is to withstand that. How? By clothing ourselves, reminding ourselves that we are clothed with Jesus and his finished work. We remember to stay in faith because being in faith and trusting in Jesus' performance and not our own will quench all the fiery darts from the evil one. Okay, so remember this was spoken, the context under the Gospels was Jesus was born under the law, Paul said, to redeem those under the law. Um, we are post-cross, we are new covenant believers under grace, not under the Mosaic law. Jesus has gone to the cross, he's disarmed sin and death, disarmed, disarmed the adversary. We now have the very spirit of Jesus within us so we can do what he did and greater. But we even saw, saw that Jesus himself did not address the heavenlies and spiritual warfare and go in angelic warfare. He dealt with personal lives and healed the sick and, and uh, they many were added to the kingdom. Okay, so again, I think it's so important that we understand this, that the condition of the heart really determines whether a person, an individual, a group, a city, a region, even a country, where they're going to accept or reject Jesus. Okay, and I've mentioned this, God, we just really need to understand the boundaries that we have in prayer, the boundaries of God. God, there's everybody says that God's all powerful, God can do whatever he wants to do. Yes, God is all powerful, but God can't do everything that he wants to do. His word says there's several things he can't do. God cannot lie, he cannot change his mind, he cannot prove false, he cannot break or alter his covenant. So, and also when you see the condition of a man's a heart, being all powerful, being all knowing, being present all the time, being omniscient, omnipresent and omnipotent doesn't change the condition of a man's heart. We saw that with Israel, uh, with, yeah, with Israel we're, when they were coming out of Egypt, didn't we? That uh, no matter how much love that God showed them, no matter how much power that he showed through splitting the Red Sea, providing for them, they had um, manna in the morning, they had quail at night, they had water come out of a rock twice, bitter waters turning sweet. There was 10 supernatural signs for uh, Israel. And, and God said to them, these people have rejected me 10 times. And 10 is the number of completion, which meant they had totally rejected God as their king, as their Lord, as their savior. And so regardless of the love and the power that God demonstrated towards them um, is that they still rejected him. So it didn't change the condition of their heart. God cannot override a person's free will. God is love. And as 1 Corinthians 13 says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, that love cannot force its own will, will not force its own will or way upon another. Satan also, we've covered this, cannot override a person's will and make a person do it. You have to submit and come under and agree with the lies and the deceptions about God, about yourself, about whatever. And that's why understanding the new covenant is so important. And we shared in this last two lessons as we went on through spiritual warfare that when Jesus himself shared on the kingdom, the parable of the kingdom with the parable of the sower and he talked about this, the farmer went and sowed the seed and he spoke about three conditions of the ground where the seed was sown. One was on the wayside, 
where the birds of the air snatched the word immediately. And he said that was Satan coming immediately for the word. But the word wasn't sown in the ground. It was sown by the wayside. The other seed was sown along rocks and thorns and thistles. Uh, so it was amongst other things. So other things grew over and took. Um, so Trob, he says the, in the definition of that or the the, um, the understanding of that parable, he said uh, this is what that seed is like. It's thrown among a heart and people sort of hear it it's not really established so they hear it but it's not really they haven't really accepted it so their cares of this world the tribulation and the lusts and desires for other things come and choke it and make that unfruitful but we saw that those who heard the word the context were like the soil the seed sown on good soil they heard the word they accepted it they responded to the gospel so the kingdom the seed and the seed is the word of god the seed is about Jesus and his finished work it came and produced fruit in their lives a crop 30 60 100 times from what was sown but it was all dependent on the condition of a person's heart the condition of the soil and and Jesus used something in the natural that to explain uh, something uh, spiritual in that, that happens in the spiritual it, like really very simply I believe so it's so incredibly simple so unless if you're ministering to someone if you're ministering to an area a city a region and it, unless the holy spirit specifically leads you to do something if they refuse to listen if they reject seriously as jesus said just leave them be i'm not saying reject them i'm not saying be mean to them you know especially if they're close to you love them but just leave them be let the holy spirit do what he does and continue to to convince them of the need of the savior for those uh, loved ones that maybe have rejected you rejected the church or rejected you for whatever reason don't play the Holy Spirit unless the Holy Spirit has specifically given you a word in knowledge, a word in season for them. Just leave them be and just love them and uh, just let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit and don't and take that over. Okay, so just let's go. Let's go now to Paul's ministry. So we're going to look at here what Paul did and what as the different regions he went into. And he faced a lot of demonic um, activity wherever he went. So just you can uh, pause this, look at the scriptures and read through this in your own time. But reading through the book of Acts is really interesting as you begin to see the, some of the stuff that Paul faced. Um, I tell you, what a man, to, to what he did and what he faced in preaching the gospel. And so if anybody was going to share anything on spiritual warfare and what we needed to do, uh, you, we would have also heard it from Paul but we're going to look at what Paul did and what he faced and and how he addressed certain things so in Macedonia we're picking up in Acts chapter 16 and Acts is the history of the new the the new covenant church uh, Luke has written this they believe that Luke wrote this as a testimony uh, for Paul when he was taken to court um, and they're outlining everything that happened so Luke, Acts 16 and I think the later chapters were written uh, Luke wrote when he was on the journeys with Paul as Paul went on his mission journeys. So 6 to 10 says, Now when they had gone through Ferga, and just forgive my uh, pronunciations of these Greek words, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Okay, did you see that? They'd gone to Ferga and the region of Galatia. They were forbidden by who? The Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they'd come to my Asia, they tried to go to Bithan Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Again, the Holy Spirit permitted them to go there. So passing by my Asia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought, that's Luke talking here, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And then as you read that, you see that, that this man and a whole lot in that area came into the kingdom. And so really what I wanted to point out here is the Holy Spirit didn't want them to go to Asia at this time. We're going to see as we get to Acts chapter 19, all of Asia was preached to. Uh, but it wasn't the right time. And so here God is leading them by his spirit. He's leading Paul and his uh, ministry team to an area where the Lord knew where people's hearts were ready to receive the gospel. 
okay? It, you know, sometimes we just think we'll go here and we'll preach and we just have to pray and do all this stuff and we're going to break through and we're going to get the answer. But this is where we need wisdom to hear the Holy Spirit about where to go and where to minister because he knows where their hearts are ready to receive the gospel. Otherwise, you you just have to go to village to village and wipe the dust off your feet and it's not the right time. So, And it doesn't mean the gospel wasn't powerful because Paul says the gospel is the power of salvation and he said he demonstrated the kingdom with power by uh, with the preaching of the gospel. Okay, so here there's a whole group of believers in Macedonia. So the Holy Spirit was leading them to this specific region because they were ready and open and many came uh, into the kingdom. So we need to have that understanding. And again, Paul, it just was not the right time for Asia, I believe. And so later on down the track, you know, quite a few years down the track, Paul does go to Asia, as we see, and the whole region got to hear the gospel message. Right time, right place. Okay, so it's important that we're led. So Paul could have been blue in the face with spiritual warfare, and really he didn't do it because it was unnecessary. Really, we need to hear the condition of our person's heart. What do we do? What do we say? What don't we say? Or an area. Even some churches. I've been invited to some churches to preach. And I get an inner witness like, no, it's it's a, not the right um, area. They're not going to receive what you're going to sh- share or say. There hasn't been too many. Uh, but I have had the old one where the Holy Spirit said they're not going to receive you. And much against my own better judgment because I wanted to go and I thought on the outside everything looked great. Um, but you just need to hear. Okay, so Macedonia, then Philippi. So we'll go, that's still in Acts 16. So let's look at this as we continue. So Acts 16, continuing from verses 16 to 21. It says, now once uh, we, when we were going to a place of prayer, and now they're in Philippi, he said, we met by, were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now on the service, that sounds pretty good, right? And you think, oh, good, she's, you know, she's preparing the way for Paul, if you like. <laughs> Tongue in cheek then, absolutely not. Really, when you're looking at this, she was mocking them. She was following Paul around because look at this. She kept this up for many days. So everywhere Paul was going, she was saying, you know, and the companions, these servers, the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She was mocking them. It was not a godly thing. Otherwise, you know. Paul wouldn't have done what he did because it says finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ I command you to come out of her and at that moment the spirit left her okay when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone (laughs) money speaks doesn't it my friends they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to, to face the authorities And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. So it's not just here. If you keep reading what's happening, Paul's preaching the kingdom everywhere he's going. Okay. Um, This is just one account that Luke has made mention of because it was, you know, quite a, um, the outcome and what happened was worth noting. So here, so that Paul and Silas was dragged, uh, was dragged into the marketplace to face the authorities. And the magistrate said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. Why? Because they're preaching Jesus and his finished work. Okay, so in Philippi, as we continue to read, and just through time, we're not going to go through it, verses 22 to 24, says how they tore off the Pauls of Paul and Silas, they beat them. They were severely beaten. They were just so that they wouldn't escape. Their feet were shackled. They were thrown into the inner prison. So not the outer uh, prisons, but in the deep dungeon so that they couldn't escape. And the jailer was told um, not to let them go. So then in verses 25 to 34, it talks about how Paul and Silas began to pray and sing uh, to God and praise God. And they did it aloud. And then suddenly an earthquake came broke them free from their shackles, broke all the prison doors off, um, and they were free. And then what happens is amazing because they didn't run off and escape because the jailer then saw what happened. It said he drew his sword. He was going to kill himself. And Paul said, no, we're all here. 
we're all here. And so with that sign and wonder, Paul preaches to him. He then takes Paul and Silas to his own home, washes, cleanses their wounds. The whole household comes into the kingdom. Then from that, as you continue to read, um, uh, then because really Paul and Silas, Really, the, the magistrates and that they found them, they weren't really guilty of anything except for these people that weren't going to make money. They lost their business through this. So they said, okay, we give permission for Paul and Silas to leave. And Paul said, you know, no, in fact, I'm a Roman citizen. You've done me wrong here. You come and tell me yourself. So they had to come and they were quite fearful of that. So they came and escorted Paul and Silas. They had a, an escort out of the city so they were protected there. Um, so it's really interesting. So Paul, why he didn't um, come and share his citizenship uh, being a Roman beforehand, I don't know, but he did afterwards. But what we see is this amazing breakthrough that occurred. Um, uh, you know, there was a huge miracle occurred and how they were released from this prison cell and people came into the kingdom as a result so here we see in this pagan city that the, the, these people obviously were rejecting Paul. There was a lot of um, uh, idol worship and a lot of temple worship in, in, uh, the Philipp in Philippi. And so what did we, you know, what did Paul do? Uh, what did um, Silas do? They really went out of that city, didn't they? They didn't. There was nothing about uh, praying and warfare or anything like that. What they did, they just worshipped God. They sung to God and they worshipped God and they were set free from their physical, uh, <laughs> the physical and the natural. Um, and I'm, you know, they were already set free spiritually from what Jesus had done for them. So I think that's just think about that. What did Paul teach about what to do there? In fact, let's look at what Paul taught. This is Philippians. This is a letter he wrote to to the church in Philippians in four six to nine. Look at this response. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Let your gentleness gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, this is the end of this letter. Brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. What an amazing response. Okay, let's <laughs> focus on Jesus and his finished work there. Okay, just through time, we're going to continue in the book of Acts, next chapter in chapter 17, and Paul's in Athens now. And it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the gentle worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then a certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? So then if you read from verses 18 to the end of chapter 17, it talks about how Paul reasoned with them. He left the, um, where the temple was, the synagogue there, and he went uh, to a place where they all used to gather, and he reasoned with them over and over again about Jesus. And you'll read the discourse, how he's pointing to Jesus and his finished work in a nutshell, right? And then it says, so as a result of that, after several days of Paul doing that, some mocked Paul, uh, others wanted to hear more. We said, we'll hear more on this later. And others believed and joined Paul. So with a city given over to idolatry, for a city full of idols and temple pagan worship, what was Paul's response there? What do we see there, verse 17? What did Paul, how did Paul address the idolatry. How did he? They were sure there was many that uh, the demon, demonic activity there. They were worshiping demons. He said to the Corinthian church, "Don't partake. Don't yoke yourself to unbelievers. Don't, don't because what? Or even you know some of what they do is doing to demons. You don't want to join with that. Okay. So, but here, what does he say? He therefore, what did he do? He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily. And then with the philosophers, he then reasoned with them. 
What? He preached the kingdom, the gospel to them. He pointed to the Jews. We see throughout all of his journeys, pointing to Jesus being their Messiah, going through scripture after scripture with them, pointing to Jesus. Okay, and we saw there what was the outcome. Some mocked, some wanted to know more. They were on the fence. Others believed and responded and joined Paul's team. Okay, continuing. So I'll just, yeah, no, I'll, look, let's just make a comment on that with Athens. So if we're going to see anything about spiritual mapping before Paul enters a place or even after they rejected Paul, surely we would see some information here or within Paul's letters on how to address this. And uh, we've gone through a lot of scriptures on spiritual warfare and, and we, you really have to read into the scriptures and add to it to, to come up with any doctrine. Well, it's not doctrine, it's man-made tradition. Um, yeah. So now let's go to chapter 18 of Acts. Now Paul's in Corinth, and we've shared a bit on Corinth, haven't we? We went through last week a bit of Corinth and the first week. So Paul travels to Corinth now, and uh, he continues to preach in the synagogue to the Jews in chapter 18. So 5 to 6 says, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, and we read that two chapters prior, didn't, didn't we? He said, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. I mean, Jesus really came to a point with that too. He then began to speak to the Jews with in parables and uh, and um figures of speech and then would explain that to the disciples later because they had rejected him and he said because their hearts are hardened their eyes are blind their minds are darkened you know as the condition of their heart so here you see that here's paul preaching jesus to them and what did he do when they opposed him and blasphemed him he shook he's you know he shook his garments he basically wiped the dust from his feet and went you know basically your blood's on your own hands and he went to the gentiles he didn't rebuke, you know, he didn't do any demonic stuff over them, didn't pray, didn't give any instructions. He moved on. Why? Because he knew the condition of their heart. They were hardened. They were hardened to the message. And the verses 9 to 11, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision and said, because he said, right now, forget, stuff you Jews, excuse my language, stuff you Jews, I'm going to the Gentiles. And then as we read on, he says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He said, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. See, really here, when you look about with Corinth, what was happening, the Jews actually oppress him from six to, to nine. The Jews really are seeking to destroy Paul. They're wanting to undermine him as a person. They want to attack his doctrine and they want to kill him. They want to wipe him off and stop him from preaching that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, the Jews really turned on him. So Paul wants to flee, to flee from them, okay, because they're a real nasty bunch. And we learnt last lesson, which I'll cover in a second, how what Paul called them. Um, but God, he gets this vision and God says, no, 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 don't escape. I want you to stay there. And they're not going to hurt you. But why did God want him to stay there? Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for, for a year and six months. He stayed there um, all that time preaching the gospel because there were many whose hearts were ready to receive the gospel. So Paul was led by the Spirit in the way he ministered because God knew the condition of a man's heart, who was open, who wasn't. So he led Paul on the right time and the right place and the right people for the kingdom. So really, can you see in whatever we do with ministry is being led by the Spirit is so important. Okay, it's really about the condition of people's hearts here. And so we saw um, there, so in verses 13 to 17, yeah, that's right, so it's, it's from those chapters there, verses there that where the, the Jews begin to harass Paul as well. And remember, we covered in the lesson on praying for our loved ones in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Where's Paul? Corinth. Um, he says about those who had rejected the gospel. He said that um, the God of this age has um, 
uh, blinded their hearts lest they believe and we covered the context of that and we saw it was the condition of their own heart that gave way to that um, there. And so here is what you see happening there. Prior to that in chapter 3, he was talking about the Jews were blinded with the veil so because he'd gone to the Jews first, that they were blinded in the reading of the law of Moses. But he said when they believe in Jesus, the veil is taken away. So we covered that in that context. But also remember we covered in Corinth as well. Last lesson, I think, on spirit. No, it's the first one on spiritual warfare for others as well. We saw how Paul spoke about uh, in the letter of 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, I think it was chapter 12, how he, yeah, 12 verses 7 to 10, he called these Jews that harassed him messengers of Satan sent to buffet him. Okay, they harassed him. They Wherever they could get a chance, they dragged uh, Paul or his companions. If they weren't able to get Paul, they got his traveling companions, his ministry team, dragged them before the officials, beat them. You know, they were really, really cruel. They wanted to, to wipe them off the face of the earth, get them from stopping from preaching Jesus was the Messiah. So this is what Paul faced. And even if you read prior to this, you know, as when Paul wrote about the messages of Satan sent to buffet him in chapter 12. When you go, um, it really begins the discourse in chapter 11 where Paul starts addressing how in Corinth there were also false apostles and teachers who'd come in to undermine Paul's character and also undermine his teaching. Uh, they weren't just Jews that were doing that and, and um, Judaizers, but they were also others that were really trying to make a name for themselves. And so we saw there that Paul you know, calls them super apostles even and he goes through some of the things that he faced so you can read that in verses 12 to 28 that he said i was beaten with robs i, I was um yeah he had the the cat of nine tails you know and he goes through i was in hunger i was in thirst i was in tribulations and trials and sleeplessness and hunger all for sp spreading and preaching the gospel Okay, and this is some of what he faced by the hands of the Jews and also some of the adversities that, that came upon him and the tribulations and the suffering for him going and preaching Jesus around the whole area. You know, we looked at a map a lot earlier about Paul and Paul's ministry and where he went and how that, you know, when we spoke about speaking in tongues, we saw the whole area and the regions of, of where Paul had ministered to, that how he had the gift of speaking in other languages to communicate the gospel in other dialects. Very powerful. So again, Paul here, you know, as we saw in those lessons and we see here in Corinth with everything that was going on, that there's, you know, they rejected his message. They rejected Paul. The Jews have rejected him. There's all this stuff happening. There was temple worship. There was idolatry everywhere he went. But there's no mention of him addressing any sort of, doing any sort of spiritual map mapping or praying against any demonic forces. He just went in. He, the spiritual warfare Paul had was preaching and demonstrating the kingdom of God. In fact, he demonstrated the kingdom to get people's attention. They'd come and then he'd preach the kingdom and they'd believe, they'd get healed, they'd believe and they'd, numbers were added to the church. Um, and that's how that worked. Okay, so continue. Paul's now in Ephesus. We're now into Acts chapter 19. And it says, and so we're now into Asia now. Okay, so we're going to see Asia. So it's the right time in the right place. It says, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. Reason what did he do? Reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. That is what Paul did. That was Paul's spiritual warfare, not attacking, not travailing or laboring in prayer, but preaching about Jesus, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, what did he do? He departed from them and withdrew the disciples and then reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So here, remember, we, we covered in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go into Asia I go to Macedonia. There was a whole group of people there that were ready for, and open for the gospel. And here, a few years later, we see that Asia is ready. And so Paul, at the right time and the right place, Paul began to share and preach. We saw, see in verse 10, this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, all, both Jews and Greeks. 
amazing, isn't it? So it's really good. And then when you go down to verse 11 to 18, as you read there, it says Paul heals the sick and he's casting out evil spirits uh, as he's healing people, preaching the kingdom. And then it talks about how some it says some itinerant Jews, exorcists, seven sons of Sceva and the high priests tried to do what Paul did. So they, in the name of Jesus, they went to cast out a demon out of a man. The demon then says to them, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but who are you? And the demon, the man that they were exercising, um, trying to exercise the demon from he overpowered all of them and uh, beat them all and they left with all their clothes and there's multiple men here so it shows how powerful this demon was was beat them all stripped them all of their clothing and they ran off naked and scary but what resulted was everybody it caused such a commotion that everybody saw because uh, they could see Paul healing the sick and what Paul did in the authority of Jesus and it said that many believed many came into the, uh, the kingdom as a result of that and then as a result of that, in verse 19 to 20, it said, Also many of those who had practiced magic bought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So what was Paul's spiritual warfare in Asia? He was reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. He was preaching Jesus and his finished work, reasoning with people. He was also demonstrating the kingdom with power that drew people's attention. They would come and hear the gospel being preached. So when they believed, you know, what, how, you know, how was the demonic dealt with? People believed. And when they believed all their magic and everything they were practicing, all the pagan stuff they were doing, they burned the whole lot. They rejected it and they turned because they turned turned to Jesus. So how did Paul deal with the spirits that are over the Ephesus and Asia, which is modern day Turkey here, is he preached Jesus. He preached the kingdom. Amen. And the more the kingdom was preached and the more that the church grew, the less the demonic activity took place. So true spiritual warfare is preaching Jesus, administering Jesus, demonstrating the kingdom to people. So good. Okay, so now verses 24 to 27, we continue and it says, A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, bought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together among the workers, along with the workers uh, in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we received a good income from this business. Okay, so money, 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 right? And you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are of no gods at all. Verse 27, there is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name and they're going to lose money, right? But also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. But ultimately, they're worried about their business. OK, <laughs> money, hey. So you see here and then in between, you know, from what we just read on the previous slide here to here, you see this is where Paul uh, was, is, as it said, he was so troubled by all the gods and all the temples and all the idols that were worshipped. And there was a, um, a statue of an unknown god. And then he starts speaking of Jesus and, and then said that all the, the gods that are made by your human hands, they're nothing, they're worthless and really is pointing to Jesus alone there. And so... This is what's happened as a result. People are coming into the kingdom. They're getting rid of their idols. They're burning their books on magic, doing all of that. No longer needing to, to purchase idols. Remember, Paul was there for quite a, two years, I think we just read there. So over this period of time, you know, people aren't buying um, idols anymore. They're not going to the temple anymore. Why? Because they now believers, the church is growing in this region. That is how Paul gained victory over certain areas and regions. Okay, just briefly, I just wanted to include this. Wikipedia, as we know, is just a resource everybody adds to, but I just thought it just said it perfectly, that the Temple of Artemis was also known as the Temple of Diana. It was a Greek temple dedicated to an ancient local form of the goddess of Artemis associated with Di Diana, who was a Roman goddess. 
And then uh, the expository, expository Greek New Testament says of this, the temple was built by contributors from the whole of Asia so that the goddess was evidently held in veneration by the whole province. So really the um, temple of Artemis or Diana is really the goddess of that region where everybody worshipped. So how that, that uh, temple and how Diana and the d- demons and the authorities behind all of that, how it was discredited and how did it lose its power? What was the true spiritual warfare? What did we see? Paul reasoned and shared Jesus to the people. He demonstrated the kingdom, preached the gospel. People came to Jesus, added to the church, and they stopped going to these temples. They started, you know, the people were losing money. The trades were losing money over this. It's so incredibly simple anyway. So then, as a result of what Demetrius and all the silversmiths did, in verses 28 to 34, as you read, it says a riot resulted in and, and Paul's travelling companions. They didn't get Paul, but they got all his travelling companions, and they list a few of them, and they were seized. And then Paul himself actually wanted to go and um, confront the mob, but it said the disciples grabbed him and wouldn't permit him to go because they knew that he'd probably get killed. And then as you continue to read, We'll just look at this, just what they're saying about Diana here. So verses 35 to 36, it says, And when the city clerk, like there was a massive riot, a massive mob, and it said even they're all shouting stuff, and they didn't really even know why they were shouting at the end. They got so confused, and they're really anti-Semitic as well. So one of the guys they found out was a Jew, and they started to uh, attack him and yell at him. And so there's a whole lot of background happening here. And then so the city clerk, it said, he quieted the crowd down and he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. So he's basically saying, you know, he's, you know we know what he's saying there. But I just wanted to share that portion of the scripture just to show uh, what they worshipped and and what they believed in that area. And really how she was discredited and how uh, Paul, how this region how the, in Ephesus and what happened there is just uh, the, the spiritual warfare was Paul preaching the kingdom, people coming into the kingdom. And no, they stopped going to the temples. They stopped going into idol worship. It was so incredibly simple, wasn't it? And so as you continue to read there, then the clerk then says, look, these men really haven't really done nothing. You're really just worried about your own money. So he said, look, their courts are open. Just take this as a matter to the courts. And they basically then dismiss the whole thing and let them go. And that's really what happened there. And then what was the result? What did Paul do? What was Paul's response at the end of this? It says, And after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Nothing about, you know, you didn't pray hard enough for this, you know, none of that. Just let's go. Let's move on. It's time to go now. Let's go and preach where they're going to receive us, where they're open to us. Okay. So we see throughout the whole book of Acts, I think I've shared here, that in everything Paul faced, not once does he mention a territorial demon or spiritual mapping or anything like that to address uh, as new. this is new covenant believers. This is the establishing of the church. If there was anything that we needed to know, surely if it's not here in Luke's account of what happened, a play-by-play, uh, then surely we would see it in detail in Paul's letters. But we read through all the things that Paul said about spiritual warfare and others and how we saw that true spiritual warfare was all about clothing yourself in Jesus and his finished work. And because, you know, Paul didn't want you fighting a defeated foe. We need to be led by the Spirit when we go and minister to people to know. That's why it's so important to know what to say or what not to say. Who's ready, who's not. Because God can't override their free will. So you just, you know, really you want to have effective ministry, ministering to the right people at the right time. Okay, so there's nothing about travailing in prayer or anything like that in regards to regions or cities or even individuals. It's just you are equipped and empowered. Go and minister the kingdom. Okay, 
So again, Paul's spiritual warfare was moving in the kingdom, demonstrating the kingdom with power, healing people, delivering people. It said the handkerchiefs came off from Paul, healing people. Um, you know, it was just he moved in the kingdom so powerfully. So that drew people's attention, just like Jesus and the disciples' ministry. People will come, you know, yeah, I want to be healed. I want to be free, whatever. And then they're, they're healed and they're open and ready because they believe like, hang on, what's this? And they're ready to receive and respond to Jesus, respond to the gospel. Uh, such a simple ministry uh, method, isn't it? And it's so powerful. And I think when we add to stuff, I think we can just get so caught up in doing stuff that's not in Scripture and added to Scripture. And I think really, as we learn about intercession, true intercession is actually going to an individual, being led first by the Holy Spirit, getting a word so we can, that word... Um, in a nuxus comes from in Tonkano, which it breaks of N and in and on Tonkano, which means to hit the mark. It's the um, antonym of hamatia or hamatia, which is of sin, and sin means to miss the mark. So this means to hit the mark. The Holy Spirit will then equip you and give you a word in season that will hit the mark so that you can go and meet with the person and preach and petition them. You know, intercession isn't petitioning God on behalf of someone. It's getting a word from God because prayer is hearing and responding to God, getting a word in season. And intercession is meeting with the person, petitioning them, reasoning with them about Jesus so that they have can then respond to Jesus and his finished work and if they don't if their hearts are hardened their minds are bl blinded uh, their minds are, eyes are blinded their 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 hearts are hardened mind mind is darkened eyes are blinded <laughs> is what Jesus shared and that's through their own free will and if that's the case we really is just like okay Lord you are the Holy Spirit. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Only God can bring the increase. Paul said, one sows the other waters. Only God brings the increase. So let the Holy Spirit do what Jesus said he would do. He said he is going to convince or convict the world of the sin of unbelief, which is of not believing in Jesus. We don't need to pray or ask him to do what he's, Jesus told us he was coming to do. So we leave them in the hands of the Spirit of God and let him continue to lead others and press on others to be able to work and lead them to himself, as I'm sure he will in the right time. So just to close in this message, Paul says, I love this. He said, stand fast, therefore. And that's what we learned with spiritual, personal spiritual warfare. We stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty or in the freedom that Christ has made you free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know, stay free. Don't let anybody, you know, put you under bondage. Jesus himself said the traditions and the doctrines of men. He said, "You, all those traditions and your doctrines, you make my word to no effect. So let's be careful that we're not adding to the finished work of the gospel, okay, or the gospel or the finished work of the cross. The new covenant, which is saved by grace through faith. Okay, don't let anybody bring you back into bondage of the law under the old covenant way of doing things from putting you on the wrong side of the cross where you're travailing and laboring to get what God's already done through his son for you. Remember, you were seated at the right hand of the Father. The Spirit of God is already in you. You're already equipped and uh, empowered with everything you need. And uh, the here, as we're addressing spiritual warfare, my heart is, because I've been there, I've done that for many years, in fact, is really you end up fighting a defeated foe. You start travailing and laboring and warfaring for ministries, for areas, for people, for churches, for whatever, or even individuals. And you spend a lot of time, a lot of you know energy, and unless that person is really open to the Holy Spirit or to hear the message you're going to give them, you're just hitting your head against a brick wall. And we saw through Jesus' ministry and Paul's ministry, when that was the case, they moved on. They didn't address it in any way, shape or form. They knew that it was not either the right time or just to leave them be and to move on to where you can be effective. So it really is incredibly simple. Okay, so... Let me encourage you, don't labor. Like I think Margot was saying at the end of one of our messages that how that since she's, you know, learns more about God's love and 
what she already has through Jesus and his finished work. You know, she, even with Margot's ministry, it's less about spiritual warfare. In fact, she was saying, I feel guilty that I'm not doing so much warfare because she, she knows that what she's already got through Jesus. So now what does she do? She spends time worshipping and just sitting and soaking in his presence and ha having an ear to hear what he's sharing with her. So the times she's still spending time with him, but the focus is different. She's learning to hear and respond. And that's my testimony too, what I've learned as well. So ultimately, I just want to encourage you to, you know, still continue in your prayer times. But rather than fighting a defeated foe or laboring or travailing for what you've already got through Jesus, instead spend time and learn how to commune or fellowship with the Father. Learn how to let the Holy Spirit minister to you to reveal the kingdom, to remember we heard uh, in the message on intercession is the Holy Spirit intercedes to you by ministering Jesus' finished work to you personally. Okay, so let him reveal Jesus to you so that you can be equipped, know you're equipped, know you're empowered, and that he can lead you in every area of life. So I pray this is a very simple message and I hope that it's blessed you um, in your own personal journey and, and how you minister or don't minister in the future. Amen.